the Earth, our planet. It is basically changing dr drastically. It's a transformation that is taking place um, in a very excessive way and is transforming the concept of living on the planet forever, I guess. We're living in a very important era when technology has really reached a level that it could help us, but we also are in a state of mind that we have limited time. The globe is warming up, and it's really the consequences of the human action. The human actions have always this kind of like emissions, how we use energy, how we use different types of resources for um, you know, getting our, our people self-sustained and so on. It changes, it, it heats up our planet. Our planet has become warmer since the pre-industrial era as of two to four degrees of centigrade in different places around the globe. And this is a big change. This is something that could put a lot of pressure and change our ecosystem services. There are many different species being distinct. It's almost 10,000 per year. 30 per day are being distinct from the face of our planet. The climate change is also putting a lot of pressure on our resources. As you see in this one, the fresh water resources of the planet are getting quite more scarce. Water scarcity is not the only problem that we are facing, but this one happening in the places that most of the farming is happening and is feeding the planet, it's a crisis. It's becoming more and more complicated to provide people with food, water and energy. And this is not because our resources are becoming more scarce, it's as well because the global population is skyrocketing. The global population today is over seven and a half billion. And in more or less 30 years, we're gonna have two and a half more billion people residing the planet. Two and a half more billion people who need clothing, material, technology, two and a half more million mouths to feed. And when you intertwine this one with the urbanization trends, because the urbanization trend in the year 2007 broke as a balancing between rural and urban for the urban areas. So it became more and more people residing in those when the urbanization that started like really fast in the 1920s, 30s and ended up that in less than 100 years, starting from that era, more than 50-60% of the total population of the planet live inside the cities, and now it's going to be up to two-thirds of the population living in the cities in the year 2050. It means our cities, these ever-growing giants, and these kind of like black holes that take in a lot of resources, are going to be more populated with 3 billion people born or moved in those places. That's about 100 million per year. 300,000 per day. That's the total population of Bergen. Two days Oslo, three days of Stockholm. It's a really fast change that is changing many, many different things. When you look at this map, which one the, uh, was the most populated cities of the planet as of 2010 or even now, growing in more than a hundred years, you see that there are some cities in North America, there are some cities in Europe, some in the Asia, of course more, and then it's also continuing to grow. Cities like Tokyo with more than 40 million people, 50 million people, that's a lot of infrastructure that you need to have in place in those places and they become like a black hole for taking in a lot of resources and there is a lot of like waste being generated. That's why we need like more smarter cities. In year 2050, there are some new giants popping up. Most of these are popping up in the Indian Peninsula, in West Asia, and then finally in Africa because there are a couple of uh, populated cities in Africa now, but they're getting more and more. And then it's growing, there are giants growing. You see that this part of the world is actually getting like super organized. 
And the bad thing is most of the cities are not really well city planned. In 2100s, all of those giants, it's going to be all about Africa and Asia. There are many things happening. I mean, uh, once I read somewhere that human civilization is like different versions of the software being upgraded. Like if you're talking about like Mesopotamia and uh, like when we started to settle in the Middle East, it started to become farms and write down our history. That was the version 1.0. And then through the history, a lot of bumpers up and down different plague times and then the population grows. And finally in the 1800s, we end up with the first billion. It takes us almost 120 years to double up for the second billion. Then in less than 40 years, we get another. In 20 years, we get another. And it continues to grow. It's something that, that we didn't really prepare for, because many experts, they proclaim that maybe 4 billion is the, is the population that the planet could sustain. That's something that we need to think about. There are many different good things happening in the area of smart cities, but you could definitely match it with this map, where we have the wealth. How our wealth is spread, it's the reason for having the financial settings to actually do all of this good things, sustainable things, smart things. And this is not where we need that. There are three main historical events and eras that made our world as it is. The new world balance, as we call that. The first one was colonialism. It started with the fact that some European countries started to enrich the places which were less developed, started to claim the resources of the locals, the native, the indigenous people, started to take a lot of wealth with themselves back to Europe. And mostly, I mean, when you see this map, this is in the early 1900s, so Latin America started to already be independent, but mostly the whole world was, was owned by these big empires built up. It led that depleted resources from those countries created a new event in the history, industrialization. The Industrial Revolution, especially the Great Britain master of uh, colonialism, started to, to do it that we grow in a different way. We start to focus on industry and urban areas instead of this normal, traditional farming and animal keeping and all of those stuff that build our societies for several thousand of years. And the next one was the World War. It introduced a new superpower to the world, being the United States. And the United States was behind the idea of this ever-growing capitalism. The economy grows, it just grows. It's, just, it's not a bubble, you just you know, pump more air into this bubble. And then we had the Cold War, and as a result of all of these, it became that we built up our system based on the cheap energy supply being oil. This was a really bad idea. Not only it put the heart of the universe, the Middle East and West Asia in a war for many, many years now, it also became the fact that we actually got rid of a good carbon bank because the oil kept this carbon that is now burning and is in, in, in basically the atmosphere and warming up the planet. We released it. So we built our growth on that one. The other uh, thing that happened after those three serial events in less than 200s became that if you look at the Gini index, what's the equity between the income of people in those countries, it shows that there is a lot of inequity in our world based on being less developed, using blind communism could be like another reason, and extreme capitalism. So you could basically see like where we have like the most inequity in the world. That basically led to all of these changes that we are facing 
with this urbanization trends because these small scale farmers feeding our planet at the moment they can't run like a profitable business just think that they have a very small farm then they have like five six siblings they basically inherit the farm it becomes even less profitable then we have less water the climate change does that that we have smaller yields so what do they do they move they want to have like access to health care they want education for their children they move they move to these ever-growing cities which are not really urban plant. And they create these slums because they don't have a lot of competencies to move. And then many of those, for getting a better life, they try to just get themselves somewhere else to build a life. What did we do about that? I mean, these things are happening as a result of the resources being depleted. What did we do instead? Yes, there are a lot of good aid programs. We are providing them with essentials like food, like healthcare. Now there are less children dying, there are less infants uh, having the risk of like dying even before they're born. And then the population is growing and it's so good and so on. But have we provided them with the essential? How much effort do we put in education? How are we trying to uplift all of these hinders for their growth? There are a lot of religious beliefs, for example, standing in the way of family planning. What do we do about that? It's a responsibility that the developed world, and especially Europe, should take. When you just look at the population, you understand that this global population growth is not happening in the North America or Europe or Latin America, it's happening first in Asia and it's then it's declining because the Asian people are getting more and more educated. They start to get smarter. They start to plan like as it fits the urban settings. But Africa is growing from one billion people today to four in less than a hundred years, less than a century. That's the that's something that when you intertwine with this graph, how the population is growing and how the economy is going down per person, because the economy grows as well, can't just go up forever. It's a bubble, it's gonna explode. And per person is getting less and less. So what we are doing here, we are creating a more gapped society, a more gapped global society, a place that the human development index intertwined with this is quite unfair. It has really significant consequences for the world. That's why people sit on boats like that and try to cross the oceans and the seas and go and try to just get themselves to Europe to get a better life. You think we could shut down our borders and kill? You think we could just let them just stay like in places in North Africa and Turkey and Greece and stay there forever? No, they're just going to like, you know, accumulate there because there is 3 million more people coming in. You basically need to help these people with settings back in where they belong because we are responsible for that. It's like karma, you know, it comes back. And it's another issue that we are facing today in Europe extreme politics, nationalism, right-wing politics, not only in Europe, we have it in the United States and other places as well. So this is something that we really need to start to think about, like how we could in these changing times dedicate to these changes, how could we provide these people with access to technology and give them a better setting and create a more equal world. That's a necessity, because if you want to keep this planet a livable place, somewhere that it could still offer quality of life for the citizens and the population, so we could balance our challenges, because there are a lot of good technologies on the way. There are many scientists saying, like, if we're going up more, one more degree centigrade, or one and a half, we pass a level that nothing is really reversible. I'm thinking there is a lot of good technology coming, a lot of good uh, carbon technology, a lot of good you know, technology that makes us more smart and more digitalized and so on. But we need time for them to become more generally accessible for people. And during that time, we need to sustain this planet. So it becomes important. 
There are three groups of countries categorized by the United Nations. The developed nations, the developing nations, and the least developed nations. There are three types of developments that I could personally suggest that we should focus on. First here in the developed countries, we need to push a lot of pressure on our industries for them to become more sustainable, to become more you know, sustain in a way that we have a long-term perspective because our financial system is based on risk-taking. And there is a lot of risk in like doing this kind of sustainable businesses. It's getting more and more better, and we need time for that to establish. And this is actually the responsibility of the people, likes of us, to put a lot of pressure on our industries. Just think about like e-cars, for example. Some innovation comes in, people stay behind that, and then Suddenly, all of these gigantic automotive industry players, they start to provide you with hybrid cars. They wouldn't have done that if there was nobody asking for that. That's the same thing that we need to do to the aviation industry, for example, an industry that hasn't really developed from the 70s, 80s. There is biodiesel that we could actually like make it greener, but they haven't really changed these engines, and it's, it's one of the least developing industries. Because basically, we don't take this responsibility on ourselves. Yes, it's right, the population is growing in Asia and Africa, but the carbon footprint, the biggest ones still are coming from places like this. So we need to do that. The second one is we need to put a lot of pressure on our politicians. And why? Because we need to facilitate access to technology from our private sector in the least developed places. Developing countries, no problem. Everybody does business that. There's money, there's some infrastructure, it's good. You could go there and do like really good businesses and come back. But not many do that in least developed countries. And that's not a responsibility for the private sector. That's for the governments because our systems are based on, you know, democracy and tax. So we as people, we need to put pressure on our politicians to facilitate this transition, to give access to these technologies, help our private sector to establish itself in those places and give people access to technology. Because if we intertwine, for example, this picture with how ICT infrastructure, a platform for telecommunication and building smart cities on, it's not the only factor that enables that, but it's something that you need like as a basic to go. Most of these very sustainable cities of the planet have a lot of ICT infrastructure. And that's something that we need to provide for these other countries as well. And then we created a market that we could actually do good businesses. The developing countries. There are many different challenges for those developing countries. I guess the biggest of those is democracy and brain drain. There are a lot of people leaving those countries when they're like qualified enough to find a better living somewhere else. How many in the room are coming from those developing countries, places like India, Iran, you know? There are a lot of people who could actually go back, create a change, but the government never asked for them. There is no kind of ecosystem for creating innovation, for using all of these young talents. So the best ones, they get cherry-picked and they leave. That's an issue that needs to be solved there. And then more sustainable thinking, keeping your genie index at a good level is something which is a must. And that's something that you need to do. So see yourself as a climate leader. All of us could be that. All of us are leaders, and we could do that because our planet needs us. Thank you.